So now we're going to focus on upper GI involvement and go through some of the symptoms that patients can experience. And not everyone will experience every symptom that I list here, but these are the most common ones that I see in my practice. So when the mouth is involved, sometimes patients can have difficulty opening their mouth. And this is usually because they have tightening of their skin of their face that restricts the opening of the mouth. Um, there also can be changes that happen in the mandibles, so the, the basically the jawbone, the joints that connect the jawbone to the skull. This can also shift in terms of mouth opening. We also see decreased salivary flow, and what this means is that when you normally chew or eat food, you should produce saliva to help you digest food, and sometimes patients with scleroderma have decreased salivary flow. We can see blood vessel changes that happen in the mouth and sometimes ulcers can appear. And then patients, especially as the disease progression, can have something called tooth resorption um, where they can actually lose teeth. So what are the symptoms? So patients can have difficulty chewing. Um, dental caries are more common. So these, in other words, for this is cavities. So if you have dry mouth, it predisposes you to having dental caries. And then oftentimes patients can have difficulty with temperature sensitivity if the gums are involved as well. The esophagus though is something that really affects the majority of patients. As I mentioned, up to 90% of patients will have involvement. And really what happens is that there's um, dysmotility of the esophagus. So the muscle that helps to contract and move food down through the esophagus does not work properly. We also see that the bottom part of the esophagus, it's called the lower esophageal sphincter. This is something that's normally closed. Um, and when you eat, it opens so that food can pass through the esophagus into the stomach. Um, and then in scleroderma, what happens is it kind of stays relaxed and open all of the time. So you can imagine that if you're sitting upright, gravity will keep the contents of your stomach down. But if you recline or lay back or when you sleep, Sometimes you can have the contents of the stomach, the acid come up into the esophagus. We also see the blood vessel changes in the esophagus, and this can cause something called esophagitis, which is inflammation in the esophagus. And then some patients can even have narrowing, so strictures in the esophagus that can make it difficult to swallow. So symptoms here, again, difficulty swallowing, acid reflux, heartburn, and then chronic cough. And, and this is something that's important to realize because oftentimes patients and even doctors, when you say that you have chronic cough, they automatically assume, well, this must be related to your lungs or maybe you have asthma or a post-nasal drip. But really a common cause of chronic cough in scleroderma is acid reflux particularly if the cough is occurring after you eat or first thing in the morning after you've been lying down all night. When the stomach is involved, we can see delayed emptying. And what this means is that this, the contents of the stomach don't move out of the stomach fast enough and they, you kind of stay full longer. Um, we also see blood vessel changes in the stomach as well. And this can be a big problem um, when patients develop something called the watermelon stomach, which is a lot of in large blood vessels that can cause bleeding. So the symptoms, so if you have delayed gastric emptying, you'll feel early quicker. So we call this early satiety. You may have abdominal distension after eating, even nausea and vomiting in severe cases. And then if you do have the blood vessel changes in the stomach, the watermelon stomach, you're at risk for anemia because you'll start to lose blood and lose iron. How do we diagnose upper GI involvement? And this is an evolving area, I would say, of clinical practice in scleroderma, where we're trying to get better at early diagnosis of upper GI tract involvement. Because oftentimes, early in the course of scleroderma, the symptoms may not be there yet, or they may not be so apparent. So for the mouth, you know, all patients should have a very careful physical examination where the doctor looks inside the mouth. Um, certain labs can be done to look to see if patients have a predisposition for having dry mouth. And I've listed two here, um, SSA and SSB. These are two autoantibodies that we see sometimes in a condition called Sjogren syndrome. It's another autoimmune disease that's associated with dry eyes, dry mouth, and many patients with scleroderma will have this condition. 
Um, salivary gland ultrasound can sometimes be done. And then really dental evaluation is super important and this has to be done on a regular basis. For the esophagus, we do something called upper endoscopy. And, and again, some of the terminology here may be slightly different than what you do in the UK. So I'll try to explain more in layman's turn, but an endoscopy is when um, the GI doctor typically looks down the esophagus with the camera and they can take biopsies if they need to and pictures to get a better look at the esophagus. A barium swallow is something where you're looking to see how, how the swallowing mechanism works and if there's any areas of narrowing or strictures. And then manometry is something where they're looking at the contraction of the muscles. So I mentioned that sometimes there's dysmotility of the esophagus. The manometry will tell you, are the muscles contracting at all? And if they are, where are they contracting? The upper part, the lower part, the mid part. And the stomach, we can also use the upper endoscopy. So looking down with a camera, and this can go down into the stomach again to look to see if there's changes in those blood vessels, if there's any bleeding, if there's something that needs to be biopsied. And then a gastric emptying study is where you're looking to see, do you have delayed gastric emptying? So typically this test will involve eating something um, that's radio labeled so that they can see when they do imaging where it is and how long it takes to get out of your stomach.